Seven days and seven minutes, a series where I try a product for seven days. If I like it, then I keep it. If I don't, then I send it back. And today what we're taking a look at, the 42 inch LG C3. Now, so I've been looking for a new monitor. My 34 inch ultra wide isn't really cutting it as far as screen real estate goes anymore. And I went to Best Buy the other day to grab God of War Ragnarok. And this guy was standing there staring me right in the face. Pretty solid deal. It was down from, I believe 1300 to 900. And then open box excellent condition was 755, I think. So all in all, like almost $400 of savings, I think but that's not why you're here. I know in the last video, I said I don't recommend OLED for productivity, and for most people, I still don't. Burn-in is a real concern, and you can easily get eye fatigue when looking at the text fringing that OLED causes all day, so I wanna get into those in a little bit, but for now, I'm real excited to get this thing unboxed, so I'm gonna go do that and get it all set up. All right, so some quick specs. This is a 42 inch, 120 Hertz, 4K TV. It does use a W OLED panel compared to the QD OLED you'll see on like the Samsung G9, for example. The main difference between OLED and QD OLED is W standing for white OLED, has a white sub pixel rather than just RGB or red, green, blue. So over time, you'll see less pixel degradation or burn in because when displaying a white image, it uses that white pixel rather than having to brighten up the red, green, and blue simultaneously. The disadvantage to this is typically OLED doesn't have as accurate as colors and it isn't as bright but to the average consumer i'm going to be honest this looks just like my other oled i think the only real difference you'll notice is if running these at max brightness oled might look a little bit dimmer and qd oled might suffer from burn in a little bit quicker on the back we've got four hdmi 2.1 ports great for pc if you're running a 30 series card or newer some cable management clips a cover for the cables and you can also route those through the tiny little plastic legs it comes with not a huge fan of the legs they do feel and look kind of cheap in my opinion i'd rather have something like what's on the g on OLED over there, but they're small and they take up a small footprint, so I'm happy for that at least. The panel itself measures less than half an inch, so super thin, really easy to mount on the wall. It does have a 300 by 200 Visa mount on the back though, since this is a TV, so you're not going to be able to use a regular old monitor mount. Instead, what you're going to have to do is pick up one of these monitor mount bracket adapters. They're only like 20 bucks on Amazon, super cheap, but do keep that in mind if you plan on using a monitor mount with this, because it is pretty light at 22 pounds. And there are a ton of different apps and TV programs and whatnot you can download and use in the LG Smart Hub. I don't use that, so I'm not going to be talking about it that much. This is mainly going to be a monitor for me. So I still want to dial in the colors. I still got to mess around with some fancy zones, and I still got to use this thing overall. So let's talk more tomorrow. So what is Fancy Zones? This is essentially a tool inside Windows Power Tools that allows you to fully customize your screen layout way more in depth than Windows allows you to. It's very popular amongst people who use TVs as monitors or just have large monitors in general. You hold down your hotkey, the default is shift, and then you just drag your window around to the different partitions that you've previously set up within Fancy Zones. Really simple way to divide the screen up if you usually work on multiple different programs and Windows just isn't really working for you. But to be honest, for me and my workflow, I haven't really used it that much yet. I mainly work inside of DaVinci Resolve and I want that full screen all day, but YouTube does have this picture in picture mode if you double right click on the video you can select picture in picture from there you can play pause drag the little window around resize it however you want place it wherever you want so that will just sit on top of any other windows you have open but anyway back to fancy zones you can find it in the microsoft store under windows power tools it's completely free and it can be super useful for somebody that needs to have different windows open all day and you want to be able to rearrange them however you like but so far i've been using this thing for two days now i've had no issues with it no weird artifacts on screen or anything like that i do notice when the abl turns on sometimes Times. So how the ABL works is when the screen turns really bright, it'll actually dim the entire screen. So maybe I'll have uh, my emails up on the left on a white background. It'll dim the entire screen a little bit. And then screen dimming is something I've noticed as well. If I let it sit here without touching my mouse or without moving anything on the screen for too long, it'll actually dim the screen down a little bit to try to reserve some of that pixel degradation. Again, not a huge issue because I'm usually, if I'm working, moving my mouse around and it only happens if your screen is stagnant for a little bit. So I really like that feature because sometimes I'll walk away, grab a drink of water, not shut the monitor off, and when I come back, it's a little bit dimmer. The one thing I am unhappy about is the height is perfect for me on this desk shelf right here, but I really don't like the way these legs look. I think it totally sells it as a TV, which it is a TV, but I don't want it to look like I just have a TV sitting on my desk. So I think I am gonna do the Visa mount bracket attachment on top of a monitor mount. That'll be here tomorrow. I also got some TV backlights that'll be here tomorrow because I definitely recommend getting some ambient light for behind this monitor. But so far, this has been absolutely 
amazing, flawless, seamless, smooth experience. And we'll see what it looks like with the new accessories tomorrow. All right, so a couple downsides with the accessories, nothing major in my opinion, but definitely worth talking about. First, it is a TV, so like I mentioned, you're gonna need that Visa mount adapter if you are using a monitor arm on this thing. I'll put up the one I grabbed here. I'm sure you can grab any one as long as it has the mount on the back that's the size of a normal monitor mount, which I believe is 200 by 200, and then it expands out to 300 by 200, which this monitor is. Now, talking about monitor arms, I went with one of these stick style ones that holds up to 22 pounds, and to be honest, that was kind of a mistake. I wish I'd went with some something that can hold a little bit more. Although the TV is 22 pounds, this thing's kind of struggling and it's a little bit sketchy. So I'm definitely gonna be picking up something that has a little bit higher of a weight rating in the future. But for now it will work. But yeah, don't go with something that's the exact weight of the monitor. Give yourself a little bit of headroom. As you can see, I threw some ambient lighting behind it. I just went with these like $13 light strips from Govee. They're okay. They don't hit white perfectly. They're kind of a purplish tint on white, but they'll get the job done. Second downside though, since again, I'm going to say it a lot, but this is a TV not built to be a monitor. You are going to have to use the remote to turn it on and off when connected to your PC. I don't think this is a huge deal. I mean, it's not that hard to click a damn button, but I know a lot of people bring that up as a downside to using a TV as a monitor monitor, so I figured it was worth mentioning. But while we're talking about the remote, it does use AA batteries. Uh, I wish it was USB-C, but not a huge deal. Just make sure you have some AA batteries sitting around in case these ones die. And the remote itself is actually pretty cool. It has this like magic wand feature that's similar to how like a Wii remote works. That's how you can get around the screen, access your different settings. You can use the directional pad if you'd like, but uh, I kind of like using this. It's pretty fun. And one thing interesting is it does connect to your PlayStation as well. I was able to get past my login screen with the remote itself rather than using my PlayStation station controller. Can you use it for gaming? I don't know. I don't see why you'd want to do that, but pretty cool that it seamlessly connects to the PlayStation. I didn't have to set anything up just through the HDMI cord. So yeah, just make sure you got some AA batteries sitting around in case this thing dies. And just remember that if you are connecting it to a PC, you're going to have to use the remote to turn it on and off. And lastly, something I want to mention that I didn't mention when talking about the G9 that a couple people brought up in the comments is support for ARC and eARC. I don't use any of that stuff. I'm not too well versed in the sound system and speaker space. That was a mouthful, but it does support that. So if you do have a home theater system and you want something with eARC and ARC support, it does have that in the HDMI 2.1 ports. But now that we've talked work and accessories, I want to get into a little bit of gaming. And god damn is this thing good for gaming. I've said it before and I'll say it again, when I buy a product, one of the most important things, maybe the most important thing that I look for is that it just works. I don't wanna have to jump through any hoops. I don't wanna have to do any tricks. I don't wanna have to do any troubleshooting. I just want it to work how it's intended, straight out of the box, and that's what this TV does. Automatically, when I turn on my PlayStation, the TV turns on, so that's a huge plus. Everything looks beautiful. I didn't have to change any settings. HDR turned on automatically, I mean, this is like my dream TV. I've been playing God of War Ragnarok on PS5 and it looks absolutely stunning. In comparison to my old IPS panel that I was using, that one looks like depressing compared to this. It's so vibrant and full of life and just beautiful. It's like eye candy. And the speakers aren't great. I would definitely look into a speaker system, maybe a sound bar or just some headphones, honestly, to really get that full immersion while you're gaming. But man, this thing's absolutely beautiful. I have not a lot to say about gaming on here because it just looks so amazing. So I have nothing to say, but in a good way. But every ying has has its yang and this definitely has a downside and that's burning. So the big elephant in the room, burning. It's inevitable, it's gonna happen over time, and that's something you need to know going into buying an OLED TV or monitor. What eased my mind is the newer features that they've been putting into these TVs. Obviously, every year they add something, they get a little bit better at mitigating it. And there's a few that I haven't talked about yet that I wanna mention to help maybe ease your mind as well. Number one is pixel movement. This is a feature where the pixels shift throughout the day to try to even out where those hot spots might be. I don't notice it while it's moving throughout the day. It's super unintrusive, but I do notice sometimes it'll seem like the screen kind of snaps back into place as if it was out of place for a second. But again, I don't notice it while it's moving and you can toggle it off, but I would recommend keeping it on. Number two is a short compensation cycle. So there's two types of compensation cycles, short and long. Short compensation cycle, this is something that should be run about every four hours and it's what is called a pixel cleaning or a pixel refresh. Essentially what it does is tries to eliminate any of that temporary burn-in that you may see on the monitor if you've had something up there for the entire four hours or maybe a whole day. But like I said, this only gets rid of temporary image retention 
it's not something that will get rid of a HUD that's been on your screen for a year or something like that. Number three is a long compensation cycle. This is run every certain amount of thousand of hours that the monitor has been in use. This helps even out any long-term pixel degradation. Uh, I'm not sure exactly how it works. I'm not an engineer, but if I had to give my best guess, I would say it maybe dims some pixels around where some are already burnt out to try to even out and make any of that burn in less harsh and noticeable. This is something that runs automatically and you can't do manually. And unfortunately, I don't believe there's a way you can check if it's been run other than having a service remote. And number four and five are something that I guess I would call active burn-in mitigation. And that's the ABL and the screen dimming that we talked about earlier. Bottom line, burn-in will happen eventually, but it's up to you how fast that happens by how well you take care of your monitor. The biggest downside to burn-in, in my opinion, isn't dealing with it happening because I know I'll take good care of my TV, but when I go to resell it, having that value be a little bit lower than if you were to just sell a regular IPS or VA panel. It's like a car, the more miles you put on it, the less resale value it has because the person buying it doesn't necessarily know how well you've been taking care of it. So take care of your tech. That's my take on burning, a little bit of a party pooper, but we'll bring things back together tomorrow and wrap this up. And for day six and seven, I'm gonna group it together because I really didn't have much going on the past two days. I was planning on doing some color correction because I figured the colors were probably off, but to be honest, after playing around myself, I didn't really need to use any settings that I found online. It looks perfect to me. If yours does look a little bit off, I recommend signing up for the Monitor Guys Patreon. He uploads all the settings that he uses for colors and ICC profiles on there, and it's only a dollar. But overall, if you couldn't tell already, I love this thing. It's absolutely amazing. I think once I started gaming on it is when it really sold it for me because it just looked perfect and I didn't have to do any fooling around. So if you're in the market for a new TV for your console, this one's still on sale and you're kind of on the fence whether you want to do it or not. If you have the financial means, I would say just go for it. It's an awesome monitor or a TV. I don't think you'll be disappointed. And if you're in the market for a new monitor for work, you've been looking to go with something a little bit bigger than 32 inches, maybe something OLED, then this is a pretty solid option for that too. You could always go with the A2, which is only 60 hertz if you don't plan on doing over that for gaming. You're going to save a couple bucks there. I'm not sure if it has the same OLED um, risk management that this monitor has, but it still should hold up pretty well. I would still check out some reviews online to see how it holds up for work. Um, as far as working 120 versus 60 hertz goes, I can definitely tell the difference with 120. So if you do have the money, I would just go for the 120 to be honest. The mouse feels a lot smoother running around the screen. And if you're worried about OLED that much that you can't get yourself to pull the trigger, then just wait. Even if OLED tech doesn't continue the trend of getting better every year, it's not going to get worse. So you can always wait two, three years down the line, see how these models hold up over time. And then if they have good results then you can pull the trigger then and it'll be cheaper so but that's going to be it for today thank you guys for watching i hope you enjoyed this seven days and seven minutes type of format that i've been trying out and uh, i'll see you in the next one peace